Hello, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about a push topic 2.3, but specifically just looking at the New England colonies. So this topic has been broken up into four separate sections. The first is Chesapeake. Now we're going to cover New England, and then there will be one on the middle colonies and the southern colonies. So it's all centered around learning objective C explain how and why environmental and other factors shape the development and expansion of various British colonies that developed and expanded from 1607 to 1754. So really how you're going to answer that is by looking at each individual region. And so the New England colonies, what you need to remember is that they are initially settled by Puritans, developed around small towns with family farms, and achieved a thriving mixed economy of agriculture and commerce. Additionally, within each colonial region, we want to look at at, um, information related to their self-government. So um, the colonies are going to develop with self-government, but it's going to look differently in the different regions. Okay, so we're going to start by looking at the contextualization of English settlement, look at some colonial characteristics, and then address labor, self-government, and the impact on American Indians. So in my last video on the Chesapeake, I had a I asked you to pause the video and to copy down this chart. So this is what we covered in the last video. And now in this one, we're gonna continue and go through these exact things, um, but with New England. So here it is, here's the location. It is the present day states of Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Some of the major cities at the time were Plymouth and Boston, um, and eventually Maine, um, will be part of Massachusetts and then it will separate and it will become its own colony or its own state rather and Vermont will eventually also join this region but not at this time of initial settlement. So to review um, some concepts that are happening or some developments that are happening in England is that we have this separation from the Catholic Church and so a group of Protestants um, separated from the Catholic Church and formed what's called the Cath uh, the Church of England or the Anglican Church. And so that is the church that the king at the time supported, the king or queen, depending on what time we're talking about here. But it kept a lot of the um, rituals and requirements. For example, um, all, all English people had to attend church. Um, and so it kept a lot of these requirements that were part of when England was Catholic. And a lot of corruption also took place. And so there were a group of dissenters that developed. To dissent means to just disagree or to object. And so one group was called the Puritans. And that's kind of easy to remember because they wanted to purify the church. So they were going to stay within the church, but try to change it from the inside. But then there was a group of separatists who wanted to separate from the church. Those are called the pilgrims. They thought that the church was too corrupt to change on its own, that it, they actually needed to separate and form their own religious group. And so additionally, at the time, is there significant English overpopulation, the economy wasn't doing well. And so the king at the time, King James decided, or he desired rather, that some of these extremists, the ones that were causing a lot of issues, religious conflict, it would be better if they just migrated to the Americas. So our first group to go was the Pilgrims, and they are going to settle in Plymouth, Massachusetts. This will be the second permanent English settlement with Jamestown being the first, and they um, went with the Virginia Company as well, and their plan was to actually travel to Virginia, but instead they actually landed a few hundred miles north of Massachusetts. Not all of the passengers were separatists, however, there's kind of a mixed motive here. Some were looking for religious freedom, while others were looking for more of a, a economic opportunity. And one of their biggest problems is that they're going to land in November. And so Massachusetts, November, pretty cool. They're not going to have time to uh, grow crops. They're not going to have time to really develop shelters and what they need. And so about half of the group died in the first winter. But those that survive, um, meet some of the Native Americans in the area in the, I believe it was right in the spring. And what is shocking is that, um, I believe it was Samoset, walks up and says, welcome Englishmen. And that was absolutely surprising because they had no idea that there were American Indians at the time who knew English. Some American Indians had already traveled to London and knew the buildings. And so um, this is something that really isn't talked about much in your 
AP U.S. history curriculum or most U.S. history classes, but there were many American Indians who traveled back across the Atlantic to England to advocate for the rights of American Indians. They met with kings and queens and tried to um, tried to negotiate for their lands and things like that. So. Anyways, it was through meeting um, some of these American Indians that they learned fishing and farming skills, especially. And for the most part in this area, there's about 54 years of peace with the American Indians. The Wampanoag were the main tribe there. So the Massachusetts Bay Company is going to develop, and it's going to work really similarly as to the Virginia Company as like a joint stock company, but it's going to be controlled by Puritans, some wealthy Puritans. And they were facing some hostile conditions in England, and so they decided to migrate to America as well. And so they originally settle in Salem and Boston, but quickly expand into many other uh, cities as the population grows. Something called the Great Migration takes place where over 20,000 Puritan immigrants come over. And that was between 1630 and 1640. And so one thing that's really unique here is the way that religion played a role in the settlement. And this passage, this um, excerpt from a speech by John Winthrop really illustrates this. This is called his City on a Hill speech. And it's something that you very likely are going to encounter throughout this year. And so it says, our immediate object is to seek out a new home under a due form of government, both civil and ecclesiastical. We shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. And the idea of a city on a hill is not geographically up on a hill, but rather that they will be a model for others to follow. And they will be a model of how Christians should treat each other, how Christians should rely on God, etc. And so it's John Winthrop is this priest, he's a governor, and he is a minister, I should say, and he is going to try to make sure the government and the church are connected like a theocracy. Okay, so here is a list of passengers, and if you remember, I had a list of passengers on the previous um, video as well, and that one was mostly all young single men. So this one, this list of passengers is different. You can see a lot of similar last names here. You can say that it's his wife, his daughter. You can see ages. This is not just a lot of men between like age 20 and 35. You can see there's as young as like one years old, and there's lots of children. So you can see a, a sharp difference in who is migrating to New England. So this migration as families and the religious schools really um, impacted the um, focus of New England on education. So New England from the get-go is going to emphasize literacy because they believed that people need to be able to read the Bible in order to be saved. And so they're going to instill schools in every single town so that children can grow up with the ability to read the Bible. So here you can see is in the image is actually learning the ABCs. And uh, the very first one is talking about Adam from Adam and Eve. So that connection really between religion and school is right there. Um, again, they formed colleges. So the school that becomes Harvard in six, uh, is formed in 1636. And that one is... Um, uh, the emphasis on colleges was hopefully to train ministers, especially. And there are good harbors, um, but rocky soil and dense forests. So the economy is really mixed. It's going to have fish, furs, lumber, and farming, but the farming is going to be subsistence just for the family. So not really a lot of export of crops here, but a lot of lumber um, for shipbuilding and a lot of fishing in the fur trade. As we already mentioned, the government was tied to the church and maintained a rigid control of the community. So conflict did develop in Massachusetts, especially over these religious differences. And so that is one of the primary reasons why we see other colonies develop. For example, um, there were people who dissented against Puritans who argued against some of those practices and Rhode Island ends up being founded for those dissenters. Connecticut, on the other hand, was formed from people who believe the Puritan beliefs, um, oh, again, were too restrictive. And so Connecticut similar to Rhode Island. And then New Haven, which eventually becomes absorbed by Connecticut, was formed by people who believed the Puritan um, connection to the government wasn't enough. So they actually wanted stricter um, 
laws in a more rigid system there. So the conflict within Massachusetts is what led to the um, creation of some other colonies in New England. Two specific dissenters that you may um, read about and hear about are Roger Williams and Anne Hutchinson. So Roger Williams was a Puritan minister, but he actually believed in the separation of church and state. He did not believe that the government should be involved um, with the church. And he also supported the rights of American Indians. And so for these beliefs, he was banished from Boston. He migrated to what becomes the new colony of Rhode Island. And this is going to be the first colony that does not have an official church and welcomes um, other um, Christians. Uh, additionally, he insisted on paying American Indians for land versus um, taking. Anne Hutchinson was also a Puritan, and she believed that anyone could re receive revelations from God and that salvation was not based on deeds. And especially since she was a woman, to contradict the Puritan beliefs the way that she did and as part of who she was meant that she was banished as well. So she ended up migrating to Rhode Island additionally. Labor in New England is going to be a mix of indentured servants and African slaves. And many times, especially at the beginning, indentured servants and enslaved Africans would work side by side. Um, one third of all enslaved per uh, persons in Massachusetts were found in Boston. So Boston is going to be a major city that's part of the slave trade. Um, and additionally prevalent was the kidnapping, enslaving, and trafficking of American Indians. Um, so as opposed to in the Chesapeake, like what we just talked about, um, this forced labor is not going to be happening on tobacco plantations, but rather it's going to be happening in urban areas as more of household servants or working as an apprentice for someone in the city, you know, in a, as an artisan or something like that. Okay, and self-government. So there's a few examples of how New England set up their self-government in Plymouth with the Pilgrims. We have the Mayflower Compact, which was a uh, document where they agreed that the government would be formed by majority. So the majority would have to consent to what happened to what was happening, very democratic there. Um, in Massachusetts Bay, they organized what was called the Great and General Court, um, but only church members could vote. So there you can see the Puritan influence there. And additionally, you were you had to be adult white male property owner who also was a church member. Rhode Island, as I mentioned, was the first colony to separate church and state. And then Connecticut is also going to have something called the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, which was their formal government, but they allowed more male voters to vote than just the church members. Okay, so here are some of your key ideas. Um, the principal motivation for New England is going to be religious freedom, but also economic improvement is there. Uh, that There is an emphasis on religion and literacy. We see families in small towns and a self-government that is tied to the church. Um, and then some of the aspects of that mixed economy. Okay, impact on American Indians. As we talked about, there was about that half century of peace with American Indians, and that's where we see the first Thanksgiving happen. Um, there is um, King Philip's or Medicom's War, which I have a whole um, slideshow on that. Additionally, it is going to be part of a lesson a little bit further in this unit. Um, but what happens essentially is the peace does dissolve and uh, the chief, chief of the Wampanoags, Medicom, ends up getting an alliance of American Indians to resist the English encroachments on their land, ends up having devastating destruction for the American Indians and um, pretty much all American Indians who um, were part of the resistance and many who were not either died had to move west or were sold into slavery um, in the Caribbean. The Pequot Wars is another example of conflict at the time. Uh, this is where a Puritan ship captain was killed, and they believe they were killed by an American Indian. And so the Puritans retaliated by killing 400 Pequot and um, annihilating their entire village and selling more into slavery. And so what these two wars really illustrated was that the English fought differently than the American Indians. And again, that concept is going to be addressed more fully in a lesson further in this unit. And then last, um, there's something that develops called praying towns and praying Indians. This is going to be Christian communities of Indians that lived separately from American Indians and also lived separately from the Puritans. So there you can see a little bit of the influence that a 
that the Puritans um, tried to push their religious beliefs onto the, um, especially the Wampanoag in the area. Okay, so again, here is your chart. You've got some initial piece. There were wars due to land encroachments and cultural differences, and there were some conversions at the time. So hopefully now you have um, two columns here of this chart filled out, and we will continue on in our next lesson by looking at the middle colonies. And hopefully you feel comfortable with your learning objective, explain how and why environmental and other factors shaped the development and, and expansion of various British colonies that developed and expanded from 1607 to 1754. So thinking about especially the other factors being their motivations, so the Puritans coming for religious freedom, but the environmental factors you want to think in this area, rocky soil, which only allowed for subsistence farming, but dense forests, which allowed for good fur, um, uh, obtaining of furs and lumber, and then good harbors, which allowed for good trade back to England and the rest of Europe. So thank you for joining me. Thanks for watching and please like and subscribe.